Catherine fought her way through a media storm. The story behind the royal row over a society wedding and we ask, is it time to strip Harry and Meghan of their titles? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and your panel this week on your favourite royal program is the Daily Mail's royal editor Rebecca English, the paper's editor-at-large Richard Kay, and the paper's diary editor Richard Eden. Welcome to you all. Now and a reminder if you enjoy our show please like and subscribe to our free channel to be reminded whenever a new episode arrives. Wow what a week. <laughs> Rebecca now, there's a lot of controversies raging, and we will discuss all of those in a moment, but the royals have carried on with their engagements. They've kept calm and carried on. I know you've been to a couple of quite moving ones with Queen Camilla this week. Yeah, it's actually been a really busy week for them outside of all the, like, say, the rows and the scandal going on. Um, and I was with uh, Queen Camilla twice yesterday. Uh, the first event is, like, it's my favourite event of the royal calendar. It's when she invites... 10 children from uh, Helen and uh, Douglas Hospice and also the Royal Dale Marvellous Charity into Clarence House and these these children are terminally and seriously ill children and it's just the highlight for them. They get to dress a Christmas tree, she serves them up with sausages and mash. Um, uh, Major Ollie, who's her equerry, uh, gets the, his sword and helps them place decorations on the Christmas tree and it's just, as I think as one of the parents said to me, you know, we don't know how long we've got with our baby, mm. so it's really important for us to make memories, and this is the most magical memory they'll ever have. In fact, I was actually WhatsApping one of the parents this morning and sending them videos I'd taken of the event, just so they've got a little keepsake of it. Um, and then after that, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum, we went straight to an engagement with her in East London, where she was meeting um, women who'd escaped domestic violence from the South Asian community at a refuge there. And there was a really, really moving moment where one of the women were telling, was telling her story and she started crying and instinctively the Queen kind of reached out and touched her arm to comfort her. Now, you know, Camilla's of a generation, she's not, they're not big huggers, but she's very empathetic in her own way and it was her way of, you know, just reaching out and saying, look, you're very, very brave and, you know, what a bright and brilliant future you've got because of this incredible refuge and your own, your own strength. Um, and then actually, I should actually mention, I think I can because it's going to be over by the time this program comes out. I'm going with the King this afternoon to a shopping centre in London where he's going to view a Christmas market and he's even going to Santa's Grotto. <laughs> and so I'm very tempted, Richard, to ask him who's on his naughty list this well, wow. have you, year. Well, have you been naughty or nice? <laughs> yeah. I, I can think of a few people that might yeah. make well, and I, say, yeah, I wonder what, wonder what King Charles wants for Christmas from Santa. <laughs> I think there's a few things I can think of. Yeah. Domestic <laughs> harmony. Yeah. Well, speaking of Richard Kay, since last week's show came on air, the two senior royals who are reported to have expressed quote unquote concerns about the skin colour of Harry and Meghan's as then unborn Archie have been named widely in the world's media so you know we've got sort of like all this sort of like royal duty coupled with what must have been an incredibly stressful time. I think so and I think especially um, for the Princess of Wales. Um, Kate is quite a sensitive person. Um, she, she doesn't like being criticised, who does? But to have this sort of allegation made against you and all she's doing is, is trying to go about doing her job uh, in, an, in an effortless way, as we've seen. Uh, but this idea that somehow an innocent remark, and that's what really what it was, um, to discuss the likely colour of, of Harry and, and Meghan's child. Well, you said we don't even actually have any real evidence of what was said, do well, we? Well, we don't, we don't. Um, but we do know that uh, names were mentioned, do we not, in letters. In letters from you. And um, Mr Scobie, who is really responsible for all this coming out, has alluded to the fact that he's seen those letters, or he's, he, he knows what's in them. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, is it racist to speculate about the colour of a child? I mean, I can tell you that uh, when he was dating, uh, when Harry was dating Chelsea Davy, there was speculation then, Rebecca will remember it, you know, well, imagine if they have a child, wild uh, red hair or wild uh, blonde hair, you know. So it, it's a kind of natural discussion which people have, and, but it's been really, um, uh, been very damaging um, 
for, for Kate, I think, uh, and for Charles, but they've sort of risen above it in the way that Rebecca has just described, which is kind of the royal way. Mm. Uh, has it been damaging, though? Because I kind of feel like the, the public support has been there, really. I think so. There is, there is obviously public support for them, but mm. there's also uh, a great deal of antithesis. They're the mm. usual camp followers of the Sussex uh, crowd who, who think uh, anyone who doesn't agree uh, with their glorious Duke and Duchess of Sussex are inherently unpleasant people and in this case racist. So it, it's not good to have these uh, things banded around on social media. And, and so it's, hurt, it's hurtful for sure, yeah. whether it's damaging, time will tell. Richard, it, it is obviously an enormously inflammatory story. Uh, what, what word, if any, from the Sussexes? Have we heard from them about any of this? We have heard absolutely nothing from them since. I mean, the amazing thing over the past week is that um, sources close to them have been briefing an American newspaper about a little bit of gossip about whether they're invited to a wedding or not. But when it comes to something damaging, potentially libelous, really serious like this, they haven't said anything. They have let it be known um, that they didn't cooperate with Omid Scobie's book directly. They've, they've wanted to make that clear, to yet, put a, a bit of distance. Omid has seen the letters. Well, well, we don't know that he has personally, but certainly right. he says he's spoken to people who have. Um, but they haven't said anything about this. So obviously we can conclude that what Omid Scobie reported um, is what Harry and Meghan are claiming themselves. I think we can assume that is their claim. Um, but we haven't heard anything from them. And that, you know, that really does hark back to the Oprah interview where they threw the allegation out there and let it linger. And it, and it has done, I, th I think it has done and is doing a lot of damage. Mm, Rebecca, uh, obviously these things, as Richard Kay alluded to, really do take their toll. And you've been with the King a lot of engagements this week. How, how do you think he's faring? How's he looking? Yeah, I'm glad you've asked this because I was with him uh, on Tuesday when he went to an Advent service at a Coptic church up in Hertfordshire. And I mean, he, you know, he carried out the engagement uh, exactly would expect him to. Um, he stood on his feet for the entire service. He shook hands with hundreds of people afterwards. He was being mobbed by well-wishers. You know, more than 500 people wanted to get pictures and to shake his hand. But I obviously saw him very close up, and I my heart really went out to him because I think he looked incredibly tired and very kind of red-eyed. I mean, obviously it's been a busy year for him. He's had a coronation, three state visits, lots of engagements. But I just just as a human being, I can't believe what what is being played out in in the media and on the world stage doesn't have an effect on him as a person. I they, really felt for him. They must, at times, be absolutely desperate to lash back, to, to actually say something. They, they probably do, but I think they've taken the right approach on this and, and tried not to get publicly dragged down by the debate over, particularly, I mean, this last week, the, the Omid Scobie book. Um, and I think their attitude is very much, well, it's not actually shifting very copies. Um, you know, people oh. are... Oh, um, dear. <laughs> people are, no. people are when, when they heard some of the revelations, they were a bit like, either, oh, we know this already, or I'm not quite sure I believe it. So I think they're kind of letting the book play out and, and really seeing what happens next. Wow. And next we will. But uh, given the stress of the last week, you could have forgiven the Princess of Wales for taking a few days out of the public eye and disappearing for a bit, but not a bit of it. She has been very prominent with a smile on her face and in a series of very stylish outfits. The Mail on Sunday's royal correspondent Natasha Livingston has been covering her engagements and shared these thoughts with us. If you opened a newspaper last week, you would know it was not a great week for the Princess of Wales. But if you were a guest at the Royal Variety Show on Thursday evening, as I was, you would be none the wiser. The princess arrived exuding confidence, despite the cameras following her around, faces pressing up against the windows to see her arrival. She was totally relaxed, totally in control. It was surprising, frankly, to see it, you know, on the sidelines. I expected to see some sign of nerves or some indication of the media frenzy that she'd been caught up in but honestly it was a masterful performance in 
carrying on as normal in that slogan that ended up on the front pages, keeping calm and carrying on. This attitude continued through to next week, when on Tuesday she did her first solo engagement since the media frenzy, and she opened a new hospital unit, um, uh, Evelina London, uh, where she is patron, and it was a traditional ribbon cutting event, which the princess doesn't do that many of uh, anymore. Um, but again, she arrived in a power suit, looking absolutely in control, shaking everyone's hands, engaging with the children, it was just a normal week as far as she was concerned, or at least that is how it looked. And then that same day, she continued through her royal engagements. In the evening, she arrived in a dazzling gown with a beautiful tiara for a diplomatic reception at Buckingham Palace, looking calm, confident, relaxed. It was a stunning royal performance. Natasha Livingston there. Richard Kay, you've covered many royal scandals in the past and live to tell the tale. And by and large, whatever's going on for the family, the show just has to go on, doesn't it? It does. I mean, Rebecca put her finger on it earlier on. I mean, they go out and they do their jobs and they smile and they rise above it. I suspect the King has been affected by this because it's brought back one of the most difficult aspects of, his, of, of the last few years, uh, the relationship with his, with his youngest son, which was always very good. It was a, he had a much better relationship with Harry than he did with William, don't forget, at one stage. And, and this ongoing uh, allegation of racism within the royal family. And, and, you know, Charles is trying to shift the dial on the monarchy. We, we are in a, in a different time under his reign. And, but to have this constantly re constant refrain coming from California is difficult. But so what do they do? Well, they go about the jobs that Rebecca uh, described just now. And, smile and wave because mm. that's the, the royal routine. Mm. Richard Eden, you could argue, I suppose, if anything, that this proves that Catherine, who was not born into royalty, is actually looking really cut out for the rough and tumble of it all. My goodness, you could. I mean, look, over the week, anyone who has any doubts about sort of her, you know, fitness to be a queen has seen that over the past week. I mean, imagine what she's going through in private. We got a glimpse of that after the Oprah interview where Prince William was on an engagement and a reporter shouted a question about, are you a racist family? You know, you could really see his anger at, at that was, you know, he said, we're very much mm. not a racist family. So, you know, imagine what's going on behind the scenes. They'd be desperate to, to say something and they'll have people advising them, no, it's better if you don't. And they, they don't want to get into that sort of, you know, ongoing row with, with his brother in public. It, it's, a, it's a horrible position to be in when someone is making allegations that you can't really counter. I mean, I should say, I don't, I don't really believe them. I mean, particularly w with Catherine. You know, what was this? R remember that Harry didn't even include this in his book at all. This is the book where he included the most intimate conversations with Catherine about other subjects, but he didn't include this. No, there must be a reason for that. And my suspicion is that he felt he wasn't really on very safe ground with it. Mm. So I, I just personally, I think there's a racist bone in in Catherine's body and the idea that she was making kind of rude comment, I just I don't believe a word of it. And actually I was just going to add to that when you're talking about how they handle things in public. I remember when we were in Malaysia a few years ago with them and uh, photographs of the then Duchess of Cambridge sunbathing privately um, on holiday uh, were published by a French magazine and there was obviously a huge fall over that and that's one of the rare cases they did take legal action and, and won. Um, but I was with them that day after it happened and Kate was as cool as a cucumber. Um, you, you wouldn't have known that anything could have gone on that day. We, she went to a mosque in the morning and then I covered, I was with them as close as we are now at a reception at one of the High Commissions and, and she was as, as, uh, as elegant and as and affable as she'd ever been. Well, thank God Will for the Princess Will of Wales. We're very lucky to have <laughs> William, her. on the other hand, you could see the tension in his jaw, mm. you know, the kind of muscles flickering. He was furious, mm. but he later explained to us that's because when they got married, he'd, he'd taken a vow to her parents to protect her, and he felt he hadn't protected her in yeah. that situation. But so. why, why do you think that, you know, I mean, I, I obviously it's difficult for any of us to imagine what that kind of scrutiny is like, but Catherine 
rolling with the punches. It's something that was uh, Megan seemed too sensitive to be able to do. Why do you think there's such a, a contrast there? I suppose uh, Catherine had a kind of longer time to get used to the role. She was on the kind of fringes of William's life, I think, when they were dating for, for so long. So I suppose for her, maybe there was a, a, a way that she could kind of very slowly dip her toes in the water. Obviously, Megan didn't have that. She's obviously they're very different personalities as women yeah, as well. Yeah, don't forget Megan. Uh, her background was sort of engaging. I mean, she was used to being on a public stage, not a massive public stage, but she was, and she's a, a confident public speaker. And I think she she probably thought she could handle all this, and um, and then she found that she couldn't. Uh, yeah, she should have taken a lesson out of Catherine's book, and and things might have been different. But but going back to what Richard said. This whole scandal, because that's what it is, it is a scandal, uh, could have been sorted with a word from that couple in California. If they had distanced them themselves from the Scobie book, said something, something of an olive branch to their family, the, they would have dissipated the row massively. Mm. Well, I think the only thing we ever heard was a briefing to a, a very kind of Sussex friendly paper saying that sources close to Megan said she never intended for the names to be made yeah, public. Not, not I mean, enough, it's, it? it's not very strong, I have it's to say. It's a pretty weak explanation. So what do you think, Rebecca? Do you, can we expect any further moves from the royals on this? Uh, it's not likely to go away. Well, it, it's not. Uh, it's what we call in the business kind of the curse of the cuttings. It will always be there. But I have seen the kind of palace mood change over the last week or so. So initially it was, we're not engaging with this book, we're not getting involved. When those particular allegations came out, I started hearing, well, actually all options are open to us. Obviously my obvious question is, would that be involve legal action? That definitely wasn't being ruled out. I still don't think it's likely, mm. just for the reason of who would they sue. Mm. Um, there's not really one clear cut path for them to take, but it certainly wasn't being ruled out. But I think as the week went on, um, they were very encouraged by the public reaction to it, that people were like, Do you know what, I actually believe this even less now. And I think, I think as I said earlier, they, they feel the book's kind of doing their work for them in a way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm still being told all options are open to us, but I sense a kind of certain softening of that. Mm, Who knows? Well, I think we'll know in the next couple of weeks. On another note, Richard Eden, last week on the show, we were all saying we'd never heard a certain nickname uh, levelled at, at Catherine in the book Endgame, but a story you ran at the weekend might shed some light on it. We were completely bemused. We sat here and um, <laughs> I remember. The, the nickname which Omi Scobie had used in his book was Katie Keene. And we yeah. all sort of, have you ever heard that? I, I, did I miss it? But no, none of us had heard it. Well, anyway, it, it turns out that Katie Keene is quite a well known cartoon character in America. Now, what's intriguing oh, okay. mm. is that she appeared in a comic um, called Archie which just happened to be a favourite comic of Meghan Markle. <laughs> now, Meghan had actually quite recently spoken about her love of the comic Archie on one of her podcasts. So, Omis Scobie, who's British, who grew up in Britain, who never would have heard of this comic, suddenly heard this term around. Ooh, who could he have heard it from? <laughs> so, um, I think it's, it's, he's kind of maybe has given away more than he... Um, likes to say. That's and why you're such a good diarist, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> but so, what is, who was Katie Keene and Archie? I'm invested now. <laughs> why why is that the nickname for Catherine? Well, and Katie Keene yeah. was, um, it, it's quite negative, I think, because Katie Keene, yeah. I think, is a character who was desperately ambitious. She was the sort of girl next door who was desperate to be on the Broadway stage. And then there was a rival character who was lovely, Megan. sweet, who <laughs> cared for animals <laughs> and looked after the homeless. And then in this interview with Megan, Megan made clear that she identified with this other character. Um, so yes, it, it, intriguing indeed. It was, it was a very patronising uh, remark designed to put uh, the princess down, wasn't it? Yeah, put her in know, a box. She was, yeah. she was malleable, she's biddable. I don't think that's a bad thing to be if you're a royal princess. Let's move on. Lots more to come, including the wedding outrage, wedding outrage, and the calls to strip the Sussexes of their titles. But first, a couple of your comments. And Lillian Lake says, I am light skinned. The love of my life is very dark skinned. When we were expecting a child, absolutely everyone, ourselves included, wondered what sex the child would be, what color their hair and eyes would be, and yes, what color their skin would be. No one in either family thought we were being racist. We were just a loving family excited to meet our next member. 
Well, Maggie Davies doesn't believe that William and Harry are likely to reconcile anytime soon. I don't think you're alone there. She says, if any of my siblings had trashed me the way Harry has trashed William and his family, there would be no apology long enough or public enough to make me trust them again. While Val Potter writes in with her support for the Princess of Wales, she says, I have nothing but deep respect for Catherine. She's doing a fantastic job, always looks beautiful, raising three adorable children and managing her role as the Princess of Wales. I'm quite sure the majority of British people agree. Well, we always love your comments, so do please keep them coming in. So much more to talk about, but let's start with this new call to strip Harry and Meghan of their titles, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. We've heard experts say this before, but this one is a little more serious as it's going before Parliament. Rebecca, what's the deal? Well, my colleagues on the Mail on Sunday revealed at the weekend that, as you rightly say, a backbench MP, intends to bring a bill for consideration before Parliament uh, to strip the Sussexes of their titles. It's an amendment to a, an existing uh, piece of legislation. Is this real is. or is he just bored? <laughs> it? I, I, he sounds, certainly sounds very determined to do it and okay. I suspect there's been a few people who would probably um, support him. I mean these bills sometimes have a chance of success, more often than not they, they don't. I think what's interesting is I wrote a little piece um, for the Mail during the week, kind of in and around all of the scandal around the book, because I spoke to somebody and said, do you think anything, you know, this would prompt the King to do that? And their um, reply was very firmly, no, he will never strip them of their titles. Never, never, never. They were given to them by Queen Elizabeth out of respect. He wouldn't, but he doesn't want to... Um, completely destroy or humiliate his son uh, and he thinks it would look very punitive for him to do so. Richard Kay, you're a betting man, what do you think? I think Rebecca's absolutely right, I think there's no chance uh, that the King would do this to his son. I think the one thing which people forget is that um, if they were, let's say, to be removed, then Meghan would revert to taking uh, her name from her husband and as her husband is a born prince and he would remain Prince Harry, she would become Princess Harry, a bit like Princess Michael of Kent. And in America, they think princesses are superior to duchesses anyway. <laughs> and, and it'll just do, it'll just be more publicity, mega bucks for them. And so, no, I think the chances of it happening are impossible. Uh, you know who wants them to be stripped of their roles, don't you? Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> No, I certainly agree with Bob Seeley, but look, You said something remember, in your newsletter. Yes, I mean, we are a constitutional monarchy, and monarchs have always taken advice from prime ministers. Um, Churchill, you know, gave quite strong advice to the, the young Queen Elizabeth about different matters. And in this case, I think our prime minister ought to advise the king that this is something that should happen. The government should support um, the MP Bob Seeley's bill um, to strip them of their titles. And not just that but to strip Harry of his role as a councillor of state. I mean, remember, we are in the legal position that if something awful happened and we lost Prince William and his family and the king, it would be Harry and Meghan on the throne. Can you imagine that? You know, King Henry and um, Queen Meghan. You know, that needs to be addressed and they need to be removed from the line of succession. And yes, I appreciate they'll still be, he'll still be Prince Harry, but he won't have that title. It was a gift. It was given by the Queen only because she expected them to be working members of the family. No way would Queen Elizabeth have given them these titles if she thought they'd be trading on it and calling their children prince and princess in America. But it's absurd. I, I don't think the Queen would have stripped them of those titles either, would she? No. Um, no. Well, I, we'll, we'll never know, but um, I think quite a few things have happened that wouldn't have happened if she was still with us. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, legislators have intervened in the past, um, obviously during the abdication crisis, uh, the then king took, took advice from the government of the day uh, that the Duchess of Windsor, who married the Duke of Windsor, should not be called an HRH. So, you know, it could happen. Mm. I suppose the difference is whether it could happen or whether the king will be the one to do it. And I think that's what I'm yeah. saying is that I don't think the king will ever be the one to do it. It would have to be almost a decision taken out of his hands, or at least make it look like it was somebody else who was well, doing it. Well, this is a, one of my girl from the colonies questions again. It, 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 could Parliament instruct the King to do it? It, do, it wouldn't work that way. 
Um, no, he has no. to yeah. agree to it, but he could yeah. take advice from the Prime Minister mm. and decide to do it. But then again, it may have to wait for our next king. Watch this space, as ever. There's always something going on. And like the next story that <laughs> emerged over the weekend, this row over a society wedding that threatened to expose more royal fractures. Rebecca, for those who don't know the story, please explain if you can. I think it's a great example, this story, of actually the kind of continuing ructions that are still reverberating uh, because of Harry and Meghan's decision you know, two, three years ago. So there is the Duke of Westminster, the young Duke of Westminster, um, one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, mount man in the land. One of them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, huge landowner here, owns lots of property, very well connected as well. Um, his family are historically very good friends with the royal family and he's particularly good friends or was good friends with William and Harry. Um, I think he's godfather to Prince George and it's now emerged maybe godparent to one of the, um, the Sussex's children. Uh, he's getting married next year, it's going to be the big society wedding of the year. Um, and of course, who do you invite? Where do you seat people? It, you know, it, it, it is tricky and a story emerged at the weekend uh, I think in the Sunday Times, that um, Harry and Meghan had not been invited to the wedding because William and Kate and Charles and Camilla will be going. Um, then there's subsequently been the claim that's not really quite the case. I think Richard might be able to fill us in a little bit more on that, but it just shows you how really awkward it is. It's like dynasty. <laughs> so, so, so were they invited or were they not? Um, so according to um, sources close to Harry and Meghan, which they, um, they informed the New York Post, um, they were invited. They wanted to make clear that they, well... <laughs> Let the record show. <laughs> the wedding's not till next yeah. June, but they received some sort of save the date um, card. Um, and they claim that they then made clear to the Duke of Westminster that they wouldn't attend because they didn't want to cause any awkwardness or whatever. Um, but I, I should say that I've been told that's, that's not true. So yes, they did receive this Save the Date card, but they were subsequently disinvited. That's what Goodness I'm told. Me. Um, now, we'll probably never know, but clearly the fact is the Sunday Times had the story correct, which is they are not going to go to that wedding. So who said it'd be better if you didn't come actually, or <laughs> said, oh, you know what, I think we won't come. We'll never know, but the fact is they won't be there. The Duke of Westminster had to choose a side, essentially, and it's clear which can side I, he's chosen. Can I just say already, it's like the bride has already been upstaged by, does anybody <laughs> actually know yeah. who the Duke of Westminster <laughs> is marrying? That's and, and poor woman. Also, and also, it did strike me that out of, we've heard such deafening silence on the big issue of the week, you know, really serious allegations of racism, not a word from the Sussexes, but they feel they need to brief on whether they've got to save the date card or not. Oh. And whether they've I, still I, got I, friends. It loses me, I have to say. Well, Richard Kay, if you do invite senior members of the royal family to your wedding, you really probably do have to follow their rules, not, not the rules that you might have wanted for your wedding. Absolutely, and there's a very strict protocol um, about seating arrangements with members of the royal family and who's there and who's not there. I mean, if, uh, if, if Rich is right about this, and that they have been disinvited, that is quite something um, because they will have, I'm, I'm certain they would have been originally planned uh, to I be on the guest list. What, if you, what do you mean if Richard's right? Is, 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 Richard, <laughs> ever, uh, well, is Richard, Richard ever wrong? Well, Richard, yeah. Richard, Richard posed it in a slightly questioning manner. <laughs> we I hear say. different things, yeah. we hear different uh, things. You know, he, he's, he, keep, let's keep these things open-ended. Yeah. I mean, the Sussexes watch this programme. They, may well, be, they yes. may well be straight onto their PRs afterwards. We don't want to end up in the High Court tomorrow, do we? We know what they're like. No, I'm <laughs> cooking lunch for all my friends. I don't have time for the High Court. <laughs> Goodness me. Now, Richard Eden, you, did, uh, you have seen a parallel to in another Westminster wedding, haven't you? Yes, I'm afraid I'm getting on a bit, and I've been a diarist a long time. <laughs> So I remember the last um, Westminster wedding, which was um, Hugh, the Duke, it was his sister, Lady Tamara. And that's almost 20 years ago now. But at that time, um, there was another very awkward situation, which I'm told the Duke was keen to avoid. What happened there was Charles and Camilla had been a couple for many, many years. And they'd also, they'd started to attend some events in the presence of the Queen and things like that. But they were invited um, to the, to the wedding, as well as senior members of the royal family, including the Queen, Prince Philip. 
Um, but then I'm um, sorry to admit, I wrote a diary story in my previous job. What did you do? Uh, we pointed out that Camilla, if she attended, would have to sit uh, about five rows back and wouldn't be allowed to sit with um, Prince Charles. Well, apparently when she read it, she was furious um, and horrified because it was so humiliating. You know, it was her, her other half, her beloved, and she wouldn't be able to sit near him. And that was because, as Richard says, of the protocol to do with royals attending. So just a few days before the wedding, they suddenly announced that Charles or Camilla wouldn't be attending. They found some engagement um, with the army that um, Charles would go to. Mm. They didn't attend. And then three weeks later, they announced their engagement. So I think the two things were linked. But it is that level of kind of high, le <laughs> high level awkwardness, which the Duke would be keen to avoid this time. That must have been quite the major thing in the family at the time. It was a huge story yeah. and uh, there was another undercurrent to the whole thing and it concerned the groom's family who had fallen out with Camilla Parker Bowles as she then was and that was another central issue about the whole wedding. Um, they're all made up now but at the time it, it seemed an incredible snub. Uh, Prince Charles was absolutely infuriated by it. He, he considered it as a, a personal slight um, and it, it could have jeopardized some very long-standing family relationships. In the end, by not attending, he sent a very clear message um, and friendship survived. It's complicated being posh, isn't it? Well, I mean, seating plans at weddings, I mean, as <laughs> probably most people attest, are bad enough, but imagine having those kind of undercurrents to try and take yeah. care of as well. I mean, well. but we have to say, I mean, this is, this is really the sort of havoc that Harry and Meghan bring. Um, to put things in context, you know, the Duke of Westminster is really obsessed with privacy. None of us even knew that he had a girlfriend when mm. he announced his engagement to, this, this, to his, his fiancée. That's how private he is. So to then have the arrangements for his wedding, like, you know, turn into a controversy and stuff because of them, on honestly, it, it's horrific. I think, though, if you're inviting virtually all senior members of the royal family, then I'm afraid you're going to have to sacrifice a bit of privacy on the big day. I mean, it, it, that yeah. goes with the territory. And it will still be a spectacular wedding, which, yeah. um, who knows, it'd be nice to be invited to. So, Richard Eden, those who follow these things closely might have noticed a couple of contradictions in the way this has come out of the Sussex camp compared to other stories. I'll be honest, I'm struggling to keep up. <laughs> you know, ju just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how the BBC were briefed that... Um, Prince Harry was going to be calling his father and oh yeah lo and behold Julie on his birthday he called him and then instantly as well we found out the details of the call um, exactly how well it had gone and it was so fantastic that they were going to speak again the following week and then we had friends of Harry and Meghan letting it be known that they wanted to be invited to Christmas it'd be a jolly family Christmas again all together but now the spin from um, Harry and Meghan is that they can't attend a wedding at which other members of the royal family will be present because it will be too awkward. So <laughs> which one is it? I, I, I can't keep up at all. Also, talking about family connections, and you're always taking the mickey out of me, spending my weeks hobnobbing with I'm the royals. sorry, pardon. Uh, anything you want to tell us this week, Jo? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, M Rebecca. Might have appeared on TV with a certain member of the royal How family. How funny was that? That was, yeah, I, yes, I, one I of my other jobs my is... my cereals. <laughs> <laughs> one of my other jobs is presenting on Lorraine Kelly's show and I was there to look at Christmas gifts for all of the family and then they suddenly announced I'd be doing it with the Duchess of York. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Well, Thanks like, for the tip off to your pals, Joe. No, but the worst <laughs> thing was they made me, one of the, one of the things I was talking about was a, a card game where you have to guess show tunes for musicals and I, ha there is, it's... It's TV gold. I mean, you know, where's my BAFTA? It's like singing, humming show tunes for the Duchess of York to guess, and she didn't get any of them right. So I don't know what that says about her knowledge about musicals or my singing talent. I think it tells you what you'll do for your art, Joe. That's what it tells yeah. us. <laughs> Moving on. Earlier in the show, we mentioned William and Catherine's trip to the Royal Variety performance last week. It is a great British occasion that has brought the royals closer in contact with some of the world's favourite stars. We've gathered some fantastic pictures of the royals at the event over the years. Enjoy these wonderful moments.
As always, if you enjoy our content, remember to like and subscribe. It's free, and that way you never need to miss another episode. Thanks to my guests, Rebecca and the two Richards, and to you for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.